Can you please state and spell your last name for the record? Travis Mayer, M-A-Y-E-R. What is your occupation? I'm a field services sergeant for the Dunn County Sheriff's Office. And how long have you been employed in law enforcement? Approximately 18 years. On the evening of March 23rd of 2018, do you recall being uh, contacted related to a body being discovered in Dunn County? Yes, I was contacted by Sergeant Day. And what, if anything, were you assigned to do that day? Initially to pick up scene lighting from the Sheriff's Office, and then we ended up having a briefing at the Sheriff's Office prior to going to the scene. And what did you do with that scene lighting equipment? Transported it down to the scene and dropped it off on the roadway area by the other squad cars. Uh, then what did you do? I then went and did a canvas of the area looking at parking lots and parks and DNR parking lots along the way that potentially someone could have stopped at. I was looking to see if anything was discarded along the way between Eau Claire and the scene. And do you recall um, contacting a church located near County Highway E? Yes, I contacted the pastor of the Amy Chapel Church and spoke to him about any vehicles that were in the parking lot or if he had noticed anything out of the ordinary in the parking lot or if there was any cameras facing towards County Highway E and he told me that there was not. Uh, and then did you check a DNR parking lot near County Highway E? Yes, I did. And what did and you determine when you looked at that parking lot? That there was it was completely snow covered or it was a large drift. There was one vehicle track that had backed in, but there was no evidence discarded. I got out and walked. There was no footprints past where that vehicle was parked. And did you also check the, check the Elk Lake Tavern? I did. I pulled into the parking lot and I ended up speaking to one of our deputies who was familiar with the business and said that they did not have any cameras that faced towards the roadway. After you checked for cameras, did you uh, search the ditches next to the field drive entrance? Yes, I returned to the location and I checked along with Investigator Stalker and Sergeant Day the ditches. I mainly concentrated on the north side of the road leading from the field driveway up to the Sipple residence. And did you locate anything? I did not initially until I was uh, my attention was drawn to a cell phone case that was on the south side of the road. When we were looking at that location, I noticed some footprints there that appeared to be barefoot or stocking foot. It was hard to tell. It looked like somebody was dragging their feet. Um, and what, did you do anything else at the crime scene related to the body? When the medical examiner took custody of the body, I followed them directly behind their vehicle to Olson's funeral home and escorted the body into the funeral home and it was secured into the cooler and locked and I took pictures of that lock. The body was never opened, it was had a tab on it with the name on it on the body bag. On March 25th of 2018, uh, did you learn that the cell phone belonging to Alex Woodworth was uh, missing? Yes, I did. And what did you do in an attempt to try to locate that phone? I contacted Chief Derek Vold of the Independence Police Department because I knew that his canine was trained in article searches and requested his assistance and he responded with his canine by the name of Crush and we did an article search through that area. And so did you check um, near where the trailer was located or were you searching uh, the ditches along the roadway? We initially did the area of where the trailer was located and the trail going back to that location. Um, there was one area of interest there where the dog had showed some interest. I checked that area and didn't locate anything. We later checked that with a metal detector and didn't locate anything either. 
then we checked the ditch line between the field driveway and the Sipple residence. At that time, the water was probably three to four inches deep and running rapidly through there, and there was a lot of snow cover yet. Uh, nothing was located at that time. <coughs> Um, then on March 27th of 2018, do you recall meeting with a Jason Mangle? Yes, I do. And was uh, another investigator, Rod Dykus, with you at the time? Yes. And uh, when you met with Mr. Mingle, uh, did he agree to have his DNA taken? Yes, he did. And did you observe a buckle swab uh, being taken of Mr. Mangle's person? Yes, I observed uh, investigator Dykus take those swabs. And what was done with the swabs after they were taken? They were secured into evidence packaging and then investigator Dyke has transported them back to the sheriff's office when we were done. The next day on March 28th of 2018, did you uh, drive from the field drive entrance where the body was located to Alex's house in Eau Claire located at 511 Cameron Street? Yes, we did. And what route of travel did you take? We took the 430th Avenue to County Highway E to Cameron Street to the residence. Do you recall how long it took you? Uh, approximately 17 minutes. And that same day, did you meet with a Jeremy Kachmer, uh, K-A-C-H-M-A-R, at Racy's Coffee Shop? Yes, he was the owner of Racy's at that time. Why did you meet with him? To uh, obtain video surveillance of the business during the date of March 22nd. And were you then provided with um, video surveillance from the date of March 22nd, 2018? Yes, it was digital, so they downloaded it onto a thumb drive. And did you learn that the time and date on the videos was incorrect? Yes, it's approximately 21 hours off. So if the date shows March 23rd, 2018, I guess what time would it be on March 22nd of 2018? If it was like March 23rd at one o'clock? Would, would it be March 22nd at four o'clock? Yes. You may. I'm showing you what's been marked as Exhibit 153. Uh, do you recognize that disc? Yes, I do. And what is it? It is a disc of the video from the races. And does that disc, um, did you review it before coming into court today? Yes, I did, and I placed my initials on the front. And so it's an accurate copy of uh, the video surveillance you were provided from Jeremy Kachmer from Racy Coffee Shop? Yes, it is. Move Exhibit 153 into evidence. Is it uh, 153 or 453? I think it's 153. 153. 153 is what it says on here. Any objection to 153? No, Judge. Okay. 153 will be received. May I approach? You may. Showing you now what's been marked as Exhibit 154. Do you recognize that disc? Yes, I do. It's a short segment out of the original video. And did you have an opportunity to review it before coming into court today? Yes, I did. I also placed my initials on that one. And is it an accurate copy of that uh, a segment from <coughs> the counter view from 1054 to 1059 AM? Yes, that's correct. And do you recall briefly what you remember seeing when you viewed that disc? That was at the time that um, Ezra came into the business, went up to the counter, made an order, and then she went to the back of the business, and then shortly thereafter tapped Mar Max on the shoulder and they left the business. I'd uh, move exhibit 154 into evidence. Any objection to 154? Okay. Right, 154 will be received. And officer, is there a, a black device there that you can use a red button or a button to get a red yes. pointer on? 
I might ask you to use that while I uh, play Exhibit 154, if I have permission from the court. You, you may go ahead. Thank you. Okay, so I have it up now. And I have it paused at 754.33. Are you able to use your red dot uh, to indicate if on this video surveillance you were able to identify the defendant? I would have to have you play it a little bit so I could actually see people moving. Yes, you can stop it there. Right there is the defendant. Okay. There's no audio, so I'm going to ask you some questions. Uh, sitting at the coffee bar to the left, the hand on the coffee cup, do you know who that is? Without being able to watch a longer segment of their movements, I would have difficulty saying for sure who that one is. Are you able to determine who the subject in the bottom left corner is who sat down? That subject right there is Jason Mangle. And do you know who the person is sitting to the, I guess on our, our, his left? That would be Max. Max Martinson? Yes.
Okay. Um, now I'd like to show you what's been marked as Exhibit 155. Do you recognize that disc? I do. And what is it? It is the front door view of the same segment that we just watched. So is that the same time from 1054 to 1059? Yes, it is. And is it an accurate uh, copy of the video you recall reviewing? Yes, it has my initials on it. And was there anything you were able to do to try to improve the clarity of these videos? No. I'd move Exhibit 155 into evidence. Okay. Right, Exhibit 155 will be received. And I'd request to publish that as well for the jury. Right, you may. And is that the defendant that you observed just walking in the video? Yes, it is. Officer, when you went to Racy's, were you able to observe, was there much more to the coffee shop or is this pretty much it? It's a restaurant and coffee shop, but the coffee shop, this is pretty much encompasses the whole area. The only area you can't see is right below this camera is the bathrooms. And that person that just got up and is sitting down, do you know who that is? You're talking this individual right here? Yes. That's Jason Mingle. Who's that walking towards the camera? This one right here is the defendant.
And during that entire time, both Exhibit 154 and Exhibit 155, did you observe the defendant speak to Jason Mingle while inside Racy's? It did not appear that they spoke. May I approach? You may. I'm showing you it's been marked as Exhibit 157. Uh, what is that, this? That is a short segment of the original one showing approximately 1114 to 1115. Is that approximately 15 minutes later uh, than the previous disc we just watched? Yes. And uh, did you review that to, uh, before coming into court today? I did, and is that's it, my initials on the bottom. And is it accurate? Yes, it is. And move exhibit 157. Any objection? No judge. I request to publish that short video for the jury. You may. And who do you observe entering the building? That's Max, and the one that was directly behind him is the defendant. Is it approximately 11.15 the defendant leaves? Yes, it is. Okay, thank you. Uh, and Sergeant Mayor, did you review uh, Exhibit 153, the, the video surveillance from March 22nd, 2018 in its entirety? Yes, I did. And during uh, that review, were there any other times you located the defendant on surveillance cameras at Racy's on March 22nd, 2018, except for those uh, two clips that we played today? No, I did not. Were you able to locate Alexander Woodworth on any of the surveillance cameras on March 22nd, 2018 at Racy's? No, I did not. Were you able to locate Jason Mingle on the surveillance camera at any other time on March 22nd, 2018? Yes, I did. Can you explain for the jury what other times you saw Mr. Mingle at uh, Racy's Coffee Shop that day? I know he was in there at approximately 1.14 p.m., I believe 2.12 p.m., and he was in there for a little while that time, and then he was in there again, I believe it was 3.18, but I'd have to refresh my memory to know for sure if that's correct. So essentially, 114, 212, and 318 that day? Yes. And were you able to determine um, Jason Mengel's whereabouts during the afternoon of March 22nd, 2018? Yes, he was on various different cameras at different businesses and had been taking pictures with his phone during the day that we later recovered off of his phone and I was able to verify the locations of those pictures. And those locations were all in, in Eau Claire? Yes, one, at, one being at Racy's in the bathroom, another one being behind the joint uh, bar on Water Street. And did you learn if Mr. Mingle had uh, a car or any other mode of transportation? He had a car, however, it was disabled. I think it was last registered in 2015. And when we looked at the vehicle, it was packed full of material. He was using it as a storage area. And the tires, three of the tires were flat. Two of the, three of the tires were flat and at least one of them was cracked to the point where it likely was not gonna hold air at all because it was a very visible crack in the side of the tire. And why were you looking into Mr. Mangle's whereabouts on March 22nd, 2018? To determine if he could have been at the scene as well. And what was your conclusion? That he was accounted for in Eau Claire. Did you also review some video from the Eau Claire County Courthouse? I did. 
And were you able to determine when Mr. Mingle uh, was at the Eau Claire County Courthouse? Yes, I believe he arrived there right around 5.14 or 5.15 p.m. and was there for a significant amount of time while he was speaking to a City of Eau Claire police officer. Um, after you received the surveillance video from Racy's, did you attempt to look for uh, more surveillance videos on the route back from Eau Claire to Menominee? We did. The City of Eau Claire Police Department had done a video canvas of the City of Eau Claire, so we expanded and went the rest of the route along County Highway E. Um, I located one residence that I could see had visible cameras and I made contact with the owner there after several attempts and they advised me that they were just fake cameras to give the appearance that they had cameras. I also located one shed that faces County Highway E in Dunn County that had cameras and the individual that owned that told me that those cameras only operated when he was there with the generator running. And does Dunn County have any public recording devices similar to Eau Claire's milestone cameras? There are none along County Highway E. Um, on February 1st of 2019, do you recall photographing the defendant's clothes along with Sergeant Jason Stalker? Yes, I do. And was one of the items that you photographed uh, a necklace and bracelet? Yes, it was. And do you know where it was recovered from? that was brought to our agency by Investigator Conkey and he obtained it from the Eau Claire Police Department. May I approach your honor? You may. I'm showing you what's been marked as exhibit number 500. Uh, do you recognize that item? Yes, I do. It's the package that contains the necklace and the leather bracelet. Um, and if you could put on some gloves and open that. Do we have a scissors in there? There's one up here. Okay. And if you can just open it and not pull out the contents, just uh, look at it while it's still in the bag. And is that um, the necklace and bracelet that you recover photographing on February 1st, 2019? Yes, that is the ones that we photographed. I'd move a exhibit 500 into evidence. Any objection? No objection. Exhibit 500 will be received. And Sergeant, if you wouldn't mind bringing that down to the table. And if you could, um, publish those items for the jury. Oh, Your Honor, can, permission to publish? Go ahead. Thank you. Can I you sure, yes, please. This is the leather bracelet that we photographed. And do the buckles appear to still work on that item? Yes, they do. Okay, thank you. And what is the other item in that bag? It is the 
necklace that we photographed on that date. And does the uh, clasp appear to be in working condition? Yes, it's still solid. It's not broken. Okay, thank you. I um, also would like to show you it's been previously marked as Exhibit 639. Uh, do you recognize uh, examining that that item when you uh, took photographs on February 1st, 2019? Yes, that was a T-shirt that we also took photographs of. I request to publish 639 for the jury. You may. Sergeant, when you examined this shirt, uh, do you recall noticing, um, uh, what were your, I guess, what were your observations of the shirt? There was what appears to be a slight slit in the shirt and then there was a couple of spots on the shirt but without reviewing the what? there was a couple of spots on the shirt but without reviewing my report on that I'm I would have to see my report to sure. refresh, refresh if I showed you your report DOJ 3930 written from uh, from February 1st, 2019, would that refresh your recollection? Yes, sir. <laughs> does that refresh your recollection? Yes, it does. And so what were your observations uh, when you examined the yellow tiger shirt? That the shirt was quite dirty. There was a spot that appeared to be dirt on it right about where the tiger is. right in this area and then there was a couple other spots of an unknown substance I couldn't determine what it was by looking at it both okay. on the front and then one on the back of the collar okay thank you um, and then later on February 25th of 2019 do you recall uh, picking up some electronic evidence from the Chippewa Valley Regional Forensic Lab Yes, I do. Was one of the items uh, a Samsung tablet with a pink cover? I don't recall that I could see it in, in its packaging, but it was item number 42, which was described as a tablet. And did you, um, you know, alter the contents of any of the items you picked up in any way? No, I picked it up, I did not open the package, I drove it back to the sheriff's office and placed it into temporary evidence storage. Were you also asked to review a download from a Memorex flash drive that was determined to belong to the defendant? Yes, I was. And was there anything of evidentiary value on that? No, it was all pictures prior to the date of the incident. Were you also asked to review the contents of an SD card that belonged to the defendant? Yes, I was. And was there anything of evidentiary value on that uh, SD card? It was all also content prior to the date of the incident. I have no further questions. Great. Any cross, Mr. Nelson? Yes, Judge. Mr. Mayor, you executed a search warrant at Joshane Carlin's house, did you not? I was not present for that. You weren't there. Um, was that... Uh, are you familiar with the investigation? Yes, I am familiar with the um, investigation. Was it Jason Stalker, who was one of the members that did that? Yes. Okay. Um, you've both taken a lot of photos. You took a bunch of photos. He took a lot of photos. Fair to say? I don't think I took hardly any photos during this. I assisted him in, in laying out the items so he could take photos, but I don't believe I took hardly any during this. Okay. So the photos of the search warrant at Joshane Carlin's, that's by Jason Stalker. It's not by me. I don't know which one took them for sure. That's fair. Okay. Um, Want to ask you some questions about uh, the the scene along 430th Avenue? Okay. Yep. Um, you were there uh, 
on a day when there was a dog there, right? Yes. What day was that? That was on Sunday the 25th. <coughs> Sunday the 25th? Yes. And on Sunday the 25th, uh, the water was flowing uh, along the south side of the ditch uh, from Mr. Sipple's residence, roughly the driveway there, uh, down towards the entrance to the field drive, correct? Yes, it was draining out of the field and from his driveway along that ditch line. Um, and it was a continuous flow, at least during the day when the temperatures were warm enough? Yes. And the water was, I think you said, at least four inches deep? Three to four is what I estimated. I didn't measure it. And it was flowing? It was flowing, yes. And at some point, um, the dog, did you say it was Crunch? Crush. Crush. The dog Crush had alerted on something in the water in the south ditch, is that right? All the way down at the end by the driveway, the field, or the driveway back to this location. In the area near the entrance to the muddy road, correct? Yes. All right. Um, and eventually, uh, a, basically an old key to the Bjorki gate was found, is that right? That is correct. Okay. Um, did the uh, crush alert on anything else along that field line, or along that ditch line? Not that I recall. Okay. And then you came back on another day when the back of the cell phone was recovered. Is that right? The back of the cell phone was found that initial night. So, item 234 was found on what day? That was found the initial night. It was located there. What, in, what do you mean by the initial night? On March 22nd? March 23rd. The initial night that we res that I responded. Okay, so the first time you were there, you found the back of the cell phone? Yes. Okay. And that is in Exhibit 283. It was up here by EB, is that right? Approximately? I is there a diagram that says what each of those items means? I There is, but I can't tell you. Okay. So I'm just going, you have to go off of your memory. Do you recall which one of the items the back of the cell phone was, A, B, or C? Uh, not without, I no, I can't tell oh. you for sure. Um, but that was found on the night of the 23rd, you said, right? Yes. about your recovery of that is that did you not my initial report does state that we located that and it was there was the footprint did you make out a report sir yes all right uh, the report is uh, DOJ 184 through DOJ 188 which I'm showing you now is that fair to say Yes. And the date on that report begins on actually uh, March 24th, is that right? Yes, that's a typo on my part that should be the 23rd. Okay, so your report is wrong, but your memory is that it's on the 23rd. Yes, sir. Okay, um, and on the 23rd, uh, you say when you were there doing this uh, work, you were informed by, uh, you know who Sergeant Day is? Yes. Uh, and Sergeant Day, um, do you, so you found the back of the cell phone prior to finding the vehicle? No. Do you know what day the vehicle was found? March 23rd is my recollection. Okay. And so you showed up after the vehicle was found, it was that same evening? Yes. It might have been the early morning hours when the phone okay. was found. I don't know the exact time. And, well, 
let me ask you this. Your report says on March 24th, I was off duty at about 7.30 p.m. and I was contacted by your Sergeant Rich Day, is that right? That's what my report does say, yes. Okay, and what you're saying is it's accurate other than it's March 23rd, not March 24th, correct? Yes, my day was off in there. Okay, and so you would agree on March 23rd at 7.32 p.m., it's dark out, correct? Yes. Uh, and it was the day after March 23rd, after it was dark, the next day when you searched the lines and you found the cell phone. Agreed? It was still dark out when we were walking that ditch line when we found the back of the cell phone. Okay. And it was the back of the cell phone that Sergeant Day informed you uh, had been run over by some kids biking. Is that right? Yes. So some kids were out there biking near the crime scene in the dark on this evening? He had made that observation when he arrived on the scene. I didn't make that observation. Okay. Um, but you, um, all right, we'll ask the Sergeant Day about that then. Thank you. Um, you observed foot tracks though eventually, correct? Yes. And the foot tracks that you're talking about are in the shoulder area on the south side of 430th Avenue. Agreed? Yes. And those foot tracks uh, that you observed led you to conclude that it looked like the person was dragging their feet a lot. Is that right? They were, yeah, they were long drag marks. Okay. And by uh, long drag marks, it, it appeared as if the uh, distinct toe marks, as in the person was not picking up their feet as high as they would, and when they pulled it forward, it drug along the ground, correct? That, yes. You, um, and did you take photographs of those foot marks and where the tracks show that somebody's foot is dragging along there? Sergeant Stalker, I believe, took those photographs. Okay. And have you observed those photos? I didn't look at them afterwards, no. Okay. But what you remember seeing on that day is foot marks for the feet dragging through the, through the, uh, sand, right? Yes. Your, um, you've had many different tasks in this investigation, is that fair to say? Yes, I did. Um, one of your uh, tasks was, well, you're familiar with the journals that were recovered from Alex Woodworth's house, is that right? Yes. Um, you're familiar with the books that have been, some of the books that have been recovered from, you're familiar that books were recovered. Agreed? Familiar with books that they were recovered. That's not your type of reading material. Agreed? That's correct. Um, and so one of the things that you were asked to do was to reach out to a philosophy professor about the journals in those books. Is that right? Jackson Relevance. Goes to Relevance. I can tie it up or we can talk it on the side. Overruled. Yeah, again, I'm assuming you're not, I'm not getting diving in at this point. I'm not All getting right. in the Go ahead. Um, but you, you were assigned to contact a philosophy professor, correct? I was. Uh, and as part of that, you gave the philosophy professor information, is that right? Yes. You gave the philosophy professor, for lack of a better term, Alex's journals, right? They, yes. And you also gave the philosophy professor a defense motion, is that right? I did not give him that, no. You're aware that the philosophy professor received a defense motion, it's actually correct? relevance. It goes to credibility, bias. Uh, I can tie it up if you I'm want to. I'm going to This is it's cross examination. You, you were aware that the philosophy professor was provided with a defense counsel motion, correct? I was made aware of that, yes. You were made uh, uh, in the defense motion was information about what the defense said happened out on that muddy road. Agreed? For lack, you don't, I don't want the content, but just in broad strokes. It's essentially what the defense says happened out on that uh, muddy road, correct? Honestly, I didn't have enough time prior to that to read all of it, so I don't know exactly what was all in there. Okay, and you don't know who provided the philosophy professor with the defense motion? I don't know for sure, no. Okay, um, do you know who Dr. Tillotson is? No, I do not. Um, you're involved in the investigation in this matter, and you don't know who he is? I'm not familiar with that name, no. Okay. Do you know if, uh, uh, 
So you wouldn't know whether anybody from the prosecution team gave Dr. Tillotson the defense motion, which laid out everything that the defense says happened sure. out on that muddy road. Objection, Ooh. relevance. Goes to bias and credibility. Yeah, Judge. I'm going to overrule. You don't know whether the prosecution team gave that information to him, do you? No, I don't. Nothing else. Okay, any redirect? Um, did you find the back of the cell phone? I was not the one that discovered it, no. Okay, nothing else. All right, any recross based on one question? No, thank you. All right, All right. Uh, thank you. Sergeant Mayor, right? Yes. Okay, uh, I believe that you are free to go. So uh, have a good day, sir. <coughs> Does the defense have any other, or I'm sorry, the prosecution have any other witnesses uh, today? He'll take longer than 10 minutes, that's well, for sure. Well, how long do you think he'll take? Half hour, 45 minutes? Uh, now, we have a couple jurors that need to get up by 5. Okay, well, I'll tell you what, we have some things to do after the jury leaves for the day, so I think this is a good spot then. Uh, to let the jury go for the day. And uh, again, I want to remind all of the jurors uh, not to read anything about this case, not to do any research on your own, uh, not to watch any coverage or listen to anyone talking about this or asking you any questions. Um, very important, again, as I had indicated previously, and I don't have that instruction right next to me. I was going to read it to you again. But uh, again, anything that you see or hear outside of the courtroom is not evidence. And it, um, there's a big risk uh, that you know, your memory could be contaminated and you could bring uh, contamination to the rest of the jury. So as you can see you know, uh, in this trial and how much work this trial is for everybody, including you, the jurors, uh, we want to make sure that you follow all those rules and don't expose yourself to any, again, any media Television, radio, internet, social media, you know, there's so many different ways people get information in this day and age. Neighbors, friends, relatives, um, just do not talk about the case or do not listen to or look at any information about the case, okay? And then what we're going to do, i just give you, let you plan ahead a little bit. We plan to start with evidence tomorrow morning at 8.30 a.m. So if you're here, again, prior to 8.30 a.m. start. And Wednesday morning for the jury, it's going to be, I believe, a 9.30 a.m. start. Uh, I have to do our, our drug court on Wednesday morning, and that usually is done before 9.30. So that's when we're going to start uh, with evidence on that day. So if you have anything on Wednesday morning, you can start a little bit later. Okay, with that, uh, then we'll excuse the jury. All rise. All right. Uh, first one I have is approximately 1.38 p.m., and uh, it related to, uh, I believe it was exhibit uh, 654, whatever it, it was, the uh, uh, related to Alex Woodworth's journals, and in particular, um, the sidebar related to basically the court. There was an objection to going into that at this time. Uh, there's been a pretrial ruling as it relates to Alex's journals, and uh, the defense had requested to at least be able to, at this time, go into what re was four different doodles, basically. Again, pages identified, and the court allowed Mr. Nelson to go into that to some extent today. Again, the defense has a certain amount of time on if they choose at some point to introduce evidence uh, related to those journals, but the uh, court was concerned that today was not the day for that, given the number of witnesses and trying to make sure we keep this moving. So in any event, um, there was uh, some latitude given to Mr. Nelson, and he did, he presented some evidence related to uh, was pages, pages 1, 25, 27, 35, I believe, and that's to that extent. State objected uh, to this, and uh, so it was partially overruled, I guess you might say. Anything further either counsel would like to put on the record about that? No. Okay. The uh, next sidebar, uh, that was approximately 1.50 p.m., and... Uh, 
and 155, those two sidebars were related. There were questions of uh, now Officer Kurtzel's formal, former investigative Sergeant Kurtzel's uh, was asked questions on cross-examination about um, some investigation done for mental health providers um, related to Ms. McCannis. And uh, state objected on relevance, and uh, Mr. Nelson essentially argued uh, related to evidence that is anticipated to be introduced later. And uh, so, uh, either counselor wish to put anything on the record related to that? The state's position is given the change in plea, any of questioning along those lines was uh, irrelevant, but I understand the court's ruling. All right, Mr. Nelson, anything you'd like to say about that at this time? No, thank you. Okay, well, the court is not going to comment on that further because it relates to evidence that has not yet been received into the record. However, uh, from the court's position, assuming that evidence, or for sake of argument, if that evidence comes in, the, it would be, in the court's opinion, relevant uh, for the defense to be able to ask those questions. And rather than bringing the witness back, um, so the court allowed him to go ahead with that uh, momentarily. We didn't get into the substance of that, um, but that is all the court will say at this time. Okay, at approximately 2.11 p.m., there was a sidebar, uh, and this related to, uh, I believe it was Exhibit 262, and uh, the phone celebrate extraction or data extraction of Jason Mengel's phone by uh, former Deputy Conkey. And uh, I believe that it was basically related to that understanding that we're not going into the content, that that would be a separate issue, but that this was just related to the understanding that this was for the process, that this was, in fact, the data extracted, the media that contains the data extracted from Mr. Mangle's phone at when uh, Deputy Conkey had extracted it. Anything further either counsel would like to say about that? No. Okay, and the uh, court uh, did then, um, and again, that was just, it really wasn't so much of an, an objection as just a make sure that we didn't go into the specific contents at this time. Okay, and <clears throat> and I have at 2.30 p.m., there was a, a sidebar related to a hearsay objection. And uh, Captain McRoberts was testifying and we got to a point where there was a question that related, or he was in his answer talking about getting a phone call from uh, investiga then investigator or Deputy Conkey. And uh, we had a sidebar and uh, it was, there was basically a discussion that there was an understanding that um, they weren't going to go into the specifics of that and go directly to, um, I think, the issue of him having searched a particular area and then finding his cell phone. But I don't think the specific hearsay was ever related. Uh, Mr. Nelson, anything further on that you'd like to say? No, Judge. Okay. Ms. Nodal? No. All right. Then uh, takes us to... Um, uh, 246, there's a sort of a double sidebar related to the Instagram account of the defendant. Um, the actual, uh, first the sidebar, there was an objection about saying what the Instagram account was. We'd had a previous discussion and an order by the court prior to opening statements that a uh, I'm not sure how to characterize it. It wasn't exactly the moniker, um, but a, uh, a comment on the Instagram page. Um, but and the defense was objecting to the actual use of that at this time, in the same for the same reasons it objected to the use of it in opening statements. 
and uh, but the actual name of the account was allowed and that was clarified that that's all they would get into at this point and that related to the name um, but on the second sidebar the defense was asking that that be bleeped out so that that particular account would not be blown up because of the uh, coverage of the trial so I'm not going to repeat the the name of the Instagram account at this time uh, so we don't have that problem repeated uh, but in any event anything further counsel would like to say about that issue no no judge okay <clears throat> All right, Council, any other sidebars the court has missed? Okay, anything else that either council would like to put on the record? I guess starting with the state, given they're presenting their case in chief. Yes, there are two matters that I'd like to address before we close for the night. Uh, the first matter, uh, one of the earlier witnesses tomorrow is going to be Kevin Scott, who is the DNA analyst. And when we had uh, before we, um, I don't remember if it was before we started the trial or early on at least, we had raised the issue of one of the uh, swabs from the sexual assault uh, nurse examiner kit, which was the Mons pubis swab of the defendant, uh, was a low level mixture uh, of at least three males. Uh, it says the profile is suitable for exclusionary purposes only. And then the, the only thing they can say about it is that the possible contribution of DNA from Alexander Woodworth and Jason Mengel is inconclusive due to the limited amount of genetic information available. We don't believe that any of that uh, particular, uh, any of the results from that are relevant or admissible. And the fact that it can't exclude them, uh, you know, it, it just says the possible conclusion or uh, contribution is inconclusive. I don't think that that uh, evidence is admissible at this point in time and, and in this matter. And so uh, we would just ask that uh, Mr. Scott not be asked about the Mons pubis swab. Is there, uh, is there just one Mons pubis swab? Yes, Your Honor. And how can that be identified, uh, at least from the reports or your DOJ documents? So it is on page uh, DOJ 00-1876. It's the uh, report, uh, the crime lab report dated November 14th, 2018. It's labeled report number 13 for uh, case number W18-603. All right, and uh, Mr. Nelson, did you want to address that issue? Um, yes, just briefly now, I'd like to, I don't have the report in front of me. I wasn't prepared to make the argument, so I'd like to be able to, to talk about it tomorrow, but just briefly, um, the state has the burden of proof. And as we all know, one of the jury instructions is they can consider the evidence as well as the lack of evidence, as well as any reasonable hypotheses consistent with her innocence. If the state wants to present evidence that they had an area tested and that test excludes one person, I think the defense should be able to say, but it doesn't exclude this other person. That's, they tested it to try to exclude Alexander Woodworth and they were not able to exclude Alexander Woodworth. That is relevant information. That's what we should be able to ask about. Did you test that? Did you do that? Yeah. And imagine it doesn't oh, exclude right, about right, right. 10 million other people. Wait, I said, I okay, said. we'll start. I'm sorry. Briefly, Judge. I, Your Honor, I believe, was saying, well, it doesn't exclude 10 million other people. They didn't test for 10 million other people. They tested to try to exclude Alexander Woodworth. They tried, tested to try to exclude Joe Shane Carlin. And they tested to try to exclude Jason Mangle. I don't know that they tested to exclude anyone else. And so the, the 10,000, 10 million doesn't matter. They didn't test for all of those other people. They specifically tested to see if they could exclude Alexander Woodworth, and they were not able to do so. And then if I could, I know we're not normally tag teaming, but it looks like Ms. Vishney has some things to add. Is that appropriate, Your Honor? That's fine. Go ahead. Thank you. Again, I don't have the report in front of me, and the DNA um, experts are not my witness, but I'm well aware 
that the crime lab frequently sends out a very minuscule amount of DNA cells to a company called Starmix, S-T-A-R, I don't know if it's MX or M-I-X. Or, um, there's also another company called True Allele, A-L-L-E-L-E. -L -E -L -E. Um, and these companies can take extremely small amounts of DNA and do use something called probabilistic genotyping. Um, there's a lot of controversy around it, but I have seen star mixed used by the Wisconsin State Crime Lab, and I don't believe they did that here. Well, first off, and a couple of things about uh, but this. I could be I, wrong because I don't have. No. Hold on. Let's no, talk over each other. And I, it's, I'm going to switch over to Mr. Dufour. This was only a YSTR analysis, number one, so they couldn't do probabilistic genotyping. That only works with a full DNA sample. This was a YSTR. And if. Council believes that somehow the fact that Alexander Woodworth and Jason Mengel, uh, their possible contribution is inconclusive, and I think it's also then important and relevant that it's a low-level mixture of at least three males. Let's have, I mean, if we're going to have it in, we're going to have the whole thing in, not just part of it. All right. Well, what I'm asking the defense to do is if you can uh, tell the court tomorrow morning, and again, we'll start at 8.15, uh, you tell the court why that would make any proposition of significance in this case more likely or less likely. Uh, it sounds to the court that that, and we've argued about this before, and I've read it, but I want to review that, but uh, it seems to me that does it, it's, a, it's a no opinion. It's like they can't give an opinion. Uh, it's not a clearly it can be excluded or it can't be excluded. Um, or that our opinion is we can't exclude him as being the contributor to this. Um, and also why, if, if part of that came in, why the rest of it wouldn't come in. Um, and uh, as I understand it, there was, uh, it, it's just, it's a, it's a non-opinion, which could be very misleading and confusing. And uh, so that's, that's how I look at it at this point in time. But we'll give everybody a chance to freshen up uh, your review of this material before we argue on it further. And I will tomorrow, but I understand Your Honor's position about the non-opinion. I'm not asking his opinion. I'm asking whether he could or he could not exclude somebody. His opinion about whether he could include somebody is different. I'm asking whether he has an opinion that he can exclude somebody. And so I think that's a different, that's the other side of the same coin perhaps, but it's it's on more firm footing and I can uh, articulate it in more detail tomorrow morning. All right, well, we'll give you a chance to do that in the yeah. morning. Okay. Right. And the other concern I have, Your Honor, deals with the method of asking questions that uh, Council, uh, especially uh, in the with the last witness and some of the last questions that Council asked on cross-examination. I have some concerns about that. Council asked uh, Sergeant Mayer if he was familiar with Sergeant with uh, Dr. Tillotson. He said no. And then to ask a question, are you aware if he was given something which implies that uh, Dr. Tillotson was given things that it was somehow improper for, and then arguing that it's to show something about credibility, believability in front of the jury, when it's clear the witness cannot know if Dr. Tillotson got him, if he doesn't even know who he is. And to ask that question uh, in front of the jury and then imply that it somehow has something to do with credibility of Dr. Tillotson I think is very inappropriate. And to do that in front of the jury is extremely inappropriate. I would ask the, the court, advise counsel to not ask questions unless he has a good faith basis to believe that the witness knows an answer that's relevant. And when he doesn't know an individual and the same types of questions were asked, repeatedly of Dr. Tillotson about uh, BDSM and various things relating to BDSM when he said he doesn't know anything about it and they imply the existence of certain things and imply the existence of certain facts when it's clear the witness <coughs> has no knowledge about it and the counsel has no reason to ask that witness that information. Judge, there were objections else? in the trial. Your Honor, overruled those objections. I don't believe it's appropriate for the state to ask Your Honor to lecture me or chastise me or do anything else. They make objections in the moment. They did. Your Honor overruled it. I asked appropriate questions. They're ethical questions. I have a good faith basis to ask the questions that he did. And if anyone wants to be articulated more, I'm happy to do so. But I stand by my questions. I stand by my ethics. 
I'd rather they not be questioned by the state, especially by an attorney who wasn't participating in that examination right here, right now. And so I think it's inappropriate to bring it up here and now in court where somebody is, I'll just leave it at that judge. We were professional for six days, but apparently it ended. All right. Well, I, I will say, Council have all seemed to be very professional here. So, I, but again, I think the state is, uh, you know, ha I think they have a legitimate concern, and I'm not saying that you've done anything improper, Mr. Nelson. They maybe just don't know where you're going, um, and I'm not sure where you're going. But uh, cross-examining on areas of bias and credibility and things like that, uh, I mean, that's that's fair game. Uh, but it is not uh, appropriate to be suggesting something exists out there, planting that seed in the, in the jury's mind if you don't have uh, something. I don't know what you have. I don't know where you're I'll, headed with I'll it. I'll tell you but, now what I was doing. Well, I, I, if you would like to make a record of it, I'm just saying, you know, from this perspective, sure. where, you know, I'm not going to be, you know, I want to give you an opportunity to fully cross-examine, but there, there certainly are limits. You know, just take a look at uh, 90611 subsection 2. Um, and, uh, you know, I mean, we can tighten that down, you know, if we're getting to a point where something is, uh, you know, close to the line. But I was not implying anything was given. In fact, my point was the exact opposite. My point that was things were given to one witness, but they weren't given to a different witness. And that different witness, Dr. Tillotson, had specifically testified that his opinion was based upon limited information. And I was just buttoning up and adding to the fact that he didn't have certain information. The state has chosen to provide information to some of their expert witnesses, and they've chosen to not provide that same information to the other of their expert witnesses. And that's a true fact. Well, and Dr. Tillerson was one of those kind of some, mostly fact witness, but also with some opinions based on his diagnosis. So he was sort of a mix of both, but he was not a pure expert witness as uh, this other witness uh, seems to be or may have been or might be I don't know he hasn't been called to testify yet okay anything further um, we would just like the list of the witnesses for yes, please. all right we had uh, stated indicated a list of uh, Dunn County Sheriff's uh, Department related witnesses and uh, I see the Sergeant Day and, and uh, Deputy Reed are two that have not been called yet are you planning to call them tomorrow uh, Deputy De or Sergeant Day may be called depending on how far we get. I will not be calling Deputy Reed. Okay, and uh, does the state have an idea who who, who they are calling? Who you are calling tomorrow? Judge Carissa Wobler, uh, Kevin Scott. Wait, wait, I'm sorry, it's going a little too fast for me. Okay. Pretty slow, counsel. Just, just, just write down the last yes, name. Oh. You've got a list of the witnesses. <laughs> Carissa Wobler, Kevin Scott. Aaron Matson, as stated, uh, Deputy Day will probably be inserted somewhere in the day. Uh, investigator Jason Stalker and Joe Shane Carlin. <clears throat> if we get, if Not we get, Debbie I'm sorry. Not Debbie Carlin. Not tomorrow, no. If at all. All right. Judge, and that's as far as we have. It's possible, depending on how long those take, we might have to squeeze a couple in at the end of the day, but that's as far as we're comfortable giving an order on. Are there any witnesses uh, that you believe the court should prepare for in terms of you know, any uh, case law or s significant issues? Outside of the uh, in indication we had as far as uh, Kevin Scott, I don't believe so, Your Honor. Is there okay. Any, is there any data, content of data that you're going to get into with uh, Mr. Stalker? Yeah, the, uh, the journals. So we're going to probably want to be heard about um, her journals, Your Honor, based upon previous uh, rulings about what could and couldn't be in there. And so um, I understand that there was talk of the procedure there's been other evidence, um, but there's also talk of prior sexual activity that's outside of the scope, I believe, of what your honor has ruled regarding the 
Jason Mengel, John Hansen. And so we'd like to be heard at some point, obviously not now, about some of the other information in those journals uh, about prior sexual activity. All right. And can you, do you have a specific motion? You know, you had a, a motion that was filed that hasn't been completely addressed, and that was the motion related to uh, electronic communications, I believe. This is separate text from message. That. And uh, but if it's the the journal I'm thinking of, you're talking about you know where it all began or where it started, something along those lines. Is that what you believe? There's I believe there's a journal called Silence Broken and a, Silence another Broken. one called Journal Two. I don't know if they're referencing both, but in either and or both of them, there is information that I think should be excluded based upon your honor's other pretrial rulings because it does not involve John Hansen or Jason Mingo. Okay, well given the, the uh, defense sort of change of position with respect to the procedure. And I'm not talking about the procedure. So basically what precedes that in Silence Broken. There's information about her childhood as well as her activities in the city other than Eau Claire when she was in college, which precedes her ever meeting Jason Mangle, her ever meeting Alex Woodworth, her ever meeting John Hansen. There's some of that information in the journal, which I believe, under Your Honor's previous rulings, should be excluded from those writings. All right. And uh, what is, I, again, I, I don't know that I have Journal 2, um, and obviously I can't rule on something unless I can, unless I see it. Um, but what is the state's position with respect to silence broken? Sure, if the defense could let us know what portions they are objecting to, uh, then we could discuss it and inform the court. Um, you know, this was part of a number of pretrial motions, and so I guess I'm a little caught off guard because I thought we had this ironed out, and this is well. I think ago, this is. I don't think it was entirely ironed out. Um, and I don't know whether there's a challenge to, um, again, authenticity or if it's the content. Uh, it's the content. Okay. And uh, from my recollection, and again, I have to go back and look at the provisional ruling, but um, it seemed to me the court had ordered that, you know, what really preceded the fall of 2017 as far as uh, the defendant was really not relevant to this case. Um, is that... Uh, anyone understand that differently? Okay. That was my understanding, Your Honor. Your Honor, I have a copy of Journal 2. I'm going to give that to the court. You have a copy of Yes, I have. Thank you. Just so that the court has it, since you didn't indicate you were not familiar with it itself. Yeah, I think I have that, or had that. I mean, have it somewhere in the electronic file. All right, um, and you plan to get into that with Investigator Stalker sometime? Yes. And you anticipate that to be later in the day? Yes. All right, is there anything else other, you know, like uh, text messages or any posts? Not tomorrow. Okay. But in the future, so. All right, well again, it's helpful if, uh, you know, the court can be alerted ahead of time so that you know we can use our jury time as efficiently as we can and cover some of these issues before and after the jury is here. Okay, anything else either party wants to take up today? I just want to make sure, and I appreciate that it's a dynamic process, but just obviously Jason Mengel is a witness that is going to involve a lot of these texts or other information and so it's my understanding that he's not going to be called tomorrow I just want to confirm that so we don't have to go through and be prepared to argue that tomorrow if there was a chance to do that we'll do the preparation but I trust that they're being as honest as I mean they're, they're, they're telling us in good faith and I have no reason to, to not believe that so we're just not going to deal with Jason Mingle tomorrow right Jason Mingle will not be tomorrow but that being said there are a number of messages that I think will need to be ironed out prior to him testifying so if the court wants to set aside some time, you know, at the end of day, the day tomorrow so we can iron those out before he testifies later this week, I think that would be wise. Do you have a, a general idea of when he might be called? Um, Wednesday. 
So uh, maybe we uh, need to go a little bit later after we let the jury go tomorrow to uh, address those issues uh, tomorrow e evening, <laughs> afternoon, evening. All right. There are like hundreds and hundreds of pages of text messages between Mr. Mangle and Ms. McCandless. So um, I am really not sure what the state intends to introduce of those, but I would ask then that by the end of the day tomorrow, perhaps they provide us with which ones they actually intend to introduce through Mr. Mangle. Has that been narrowed down? Just, that has been narrowed down quite significantly, and I have no problem sitting down with the fence and kind of showing them what the state intends to introduce generally with the understanding that if something comes up, a, a question's answered differently than anticipated. Defense asks something that uh, needs to be addressed through a document. We're not restricted to specifically those items that have been previously laid out, but I don't have an issue with giving some insight into what specific messages, photos, et cetera, will be brought in through Mr. Mangle. All right. All right. Well, again, I would appreciate council doing that to narrow the issues down a little bit so we can save some time. Perhaps if the state could give me a, that over lunch hour, <coughs> I'll get a chance to look at it before the end of the day. Is that acceptable? That's fine, Judge. Thank you. Okay, and also please give some thought to, before it actually comes out, you know, what things you may not want to be out there. Again, it's a public trial. It's just that there's probably a lot bigger uh, audience than most public trials uh, that we've been involved in. So. Um, Again, if you don't want phone numbers out there, other personal information, um, try to think about that and how it's presented. 